We've been in this series called The God I Never Knew, talking about the Holy Spirit. And many of you grew up in different types of church backgrounds. Maybe you never heard much about the Holy Spirit, or if you did, it was confusing and scary. And in this series, we're trying to take some of the fear and confusion out of this topic, because whether you know it or not, the Holy Spirit is your friend, and he wants to have a relationship with you. Okay, he wants to be a blessing to you. That's why Jesus sent him to help us. We've been asking questions about him in this series, like who is he and what's he like? And we started asking some kind of controversial questions. Like last week we asked, is he Pentecostal? If you missed it, you'll have to listen to that message on the app. And today I wanna ask this question, is he charismatic? Is he charismatic? People sometimes ask, is the church charismatic? And I say, it depends. Depends on your definition of charismatic, right? Because there are some ideas out there about charismatic churches and they're not all positive, <laughs> okay? Now we use that word often in our culture in a positive way. When we talk about actors or politicians, we'll say, oh, he's so charismatic. That's a positive term in that sense. Like he's likable, he's magnetic, he's compelling. But then when we use this term in relation to Christians, people get kind of nervous. And they're like, is that one of those charismatic churches? Because I've heard some things about charismatic churches and, and, and there are some kind of misconceptions about what it means to be charismatic. Um, the misconceptions that exist, I think sometimes are that charismatic churches don't care about proper doctrine in the word of God and they care more about this experience or that maybe um, that if a, a church is charismatic, sometimes people have this mindset like they're, they're spiritually superior to other Christians, and that's not, that's not good either. Or maybe there's this idea that the Holy Spirit will give me a shortcut to spiritual maturity, and I don't need to spend time reading my Bible in prayer. If I just have a encounter with the Holy Spirit, he'll just turn me into a super Christian overnight. So if that's what you think of when you think charismatic, then uh, no, the church doesn't really feel that way. We're not that way. The Holy Spirit's not that way. But if you have the, di the biblical definition of charismatic, and you understand that, that kind of changes your perspective. Here's what the Bible uh, describes when it talks about charismatic. It, the word charismatic, it's a Greek word, charismata. It's a plural form of this word. Chariz, uh, charisma uh, is a singular form. Charis, the first part of that word, means grace. Maybe you've had some friends name their daughter Charis. So charis means grace. And then the second part of that word, ma, is gift. So plural is grace gifts. It's not so scary, is it? Right. Grace gifts. All gifts are an act of grace. You know, gifts are given not because we deserve them, but out of love. And then the Holy Spirit gives us grace gifts that we don't deserve, but benefit us because God loves us. It's just a whole lot of grace. And then obviously, if you're a Christian and you've placed your faith in Jesus, which most of you have, um, then you've experienced God's grace. So you've experienced the gift of God's grace. So if being charismatic means you've received grace gifts, then all of you are charismatic, <laughs> biblically, biblically speaking. So we're gonna talk about this. Charisma is the instantaneous enablement of the Holy Spirit in the life of any believer to exercise a gift for the edification of others. So we're gonna go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in your Bible. And we're gonna read about the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. While you're getting ready for that, some of you have paper Bibles, you gotta turn there, it takes a second. Um, this letter, 1 Corinthians, was written to the church in Corinth. It was a city and the church was made up of mostly Gentiles, non-Jewish people. The city Corinth, it was at a point where a lot of different sea trade routes intersected. So people came from all over the world. And in this city, uh, there were a lot of pagan, uh, Roman and Greek temples where idols and different false gods were worshiped. Also the temple of Aphrodite was in Corinth, a very famous kind of false god. And the temple of Aphrodite employed a thousand temple prostitutes. So in the city of Corinth, money and sex was a major idol. Sounds familiar, right? right. I know a place like that. So Paul was speaking to these people where money and sex was an idol. 
And these people had received the Holy Spirit as believers in Jesus, but they were having problems in relation to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So in verse one, it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. So you got to understand real quick, when he says now concerning spiritual gifts, he's answering their question about spiritual gifts. This is not the first letter that Paul wrote the church in Corinth. There was another letter. It's not a part of your Bible, but we don't, we don't know what it was about. But then they wrote back to Paul and they asked him some questions. And so Paul answered their questions. You can see other places in this, chapter, or in this book, in chapter seven, in chapter eight, where Paul said, now concerning your question about remaining single, now concerning your question about this. So here in this chapter, it's now concerning your questions about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. So he's going to teach them. Go to verse four. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Just notice spirit, Lord, and God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God present in giving all of these gifts. Okay, then go to verse seven. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. We just noticed that word each. For to one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Great. So we've got this passage, lays out the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First, you can kind of infer some things that probably within this church of Corinth, people were debating about whose gifts were more important and better. And that's why Paul spent some time going, hey, all these gifts come from this same spirit. So he gives these gifts and he gives them to each, each one according to his will. He's the one who gives the gifts according to his will. It's important to point this out because there's this kind of misunderstanding that when you become a Christian, God gives you a spiritual gift and that's your gift for the rest of your life. And you get to use that gift and, and you have that gift forever in particular. And that's not really the way it works. We don't have the gifts. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, owns all these gifts. They're his gifts. He has them all and he gives them to us according to his will and his desire. That means like one particular person in the church does not have the gift of healing alone, okay? God can work through any of us at any time to exercise any of the gifts according to his will for the profit of all. And that's the purpose of these gifts. It's not just to like do a magic show, but it's to build up the church for the benefit of everyone, Okay, so we're on the same page. Now, do understand this is not an exhaustive list of all the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. He also gives other gifts mentioned in Romans 12. Those gifts mentioned there, uh, some of them are the same, but also there's additional ones listed like leadership, giving, serving others. There are ministerial gifts mentioned in Ephesians 4 that Jesus gives to the church. These gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those are gifts but we're talking today about, in 1 Corinthians 12, the manifestational gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to explain these. These gifts can be broken down into three major categories for the purpose of understanding them today. There are the discerning gifts, the declarative gifts, and the dynamic gifts. And I'll talk about each of those categories. First, the discerning gifts. The discerning gifts would include the word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. First, a word of knowledge. Word of knowledge is when you know something specific you could not know by natural means. It is possible for the Holy Spirit to drop knowledge in your brain that you did not come by through natural means. That sounds pretty good, right? Like we see an example of this with Jesus and the woman at the well. People are like, well, yeah, but he was Jesus, but he also limited his divinity as he took on a human body. And so Jesus is talking to this woman and he says, where's your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. And he's like, you're right. You had five husbands and the one you're with now isn't your husband. And she's like, how did you know that about me? 
right? He had knowledge about her and he never met her before. The Holy Spirit, he can drop knowledge in your, how many of you say, that sounds good. I'm already sound, I'm already feeling good about these gifts. Like there are some times in my life, I would really benefit having God drop a knowledge bomb on me. And like, I don't have that good of a memory. You know, I don't remember anything I read on Wikipedia, but the Holy Spirit can come along and just boom, give you knowledge. It's very really helpful. One time I was talking to a woman uh, and I don't want to say too much about her to keep it private, but she told me she was uh, at a doctor's appointment and I was talking to her on the phone and I had no reason to be suspicious of anything about her. But just in that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me that what she was saying was not true. And so she said, I'm at a doctor's appointment. I said, no, you're not. And she was like, yeah, yeah, I am. And I said, no, you're not. She's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and it, she, had a, she had an issue and she needed help with this issue. And so God was able to help her through that word of knowledge and help her find help, right? That was, that was a benefit. And, and when God gives us these gifts to use, he does it to help us, not to tear people down, but to help us. So how many of you would say, okay, I could really benefit from that. God, if he gives me a word of knowledge, like that would help me. Here's the second one, a word of wisdom defined as a divine answer or solution for a particular event. There might be events that take place in your life or events that we encounter as a church body where we're at a loss for what to do, but it is possible for the Holy Spirit to give a gift to the church through a word of wisdom. It's a divine answer or solution for a particular event. I think it's also, it can also be the ability to apply God's truth to man's circumstances. So you might also think of it in that sense, or it could even be thought of like this. When you've heard someone explain scripture and show you how to apply it to your life in a way you've never thought of before with wisdom, that could also be part of a word of wisdom. And I see an example in Acts chapter five. There was a, a Sadducee, an elder named Gamaliel, and he was speaking to Peter and John, about Peter and John, who were before this court of elders, and they were in trouble for preaching about Jesus. And this guy, whose name I can barely pronounce, he says, very wisely, if their endeavor is of human origin, it will fail, but if it is from God, nothing can stop it. I mean, that is incredibly wise. And I think that was a wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave him. How many of you would say, I would be okay if God used me to give a word of wisdom or if God gave me a word of wisdom about how I could do something in my life or handle a situation in my life? What if God gave you a word of wisdom for how to raise one of your kids who was having problems or for how to handle your finances or how to invest for the future? Like that seems okay, right? The Holy Spirit's good. Like he gives us good gifts. Here's the next one. Discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits. This is the ability to discern whether a spiritual manifestation is godly or evil. There are, there are good spirits. There are angels. There are also evil spirits, demonic forces. They both are at play in the world. And sometimes we'll encounter them. And the Holy Spirit actually gives us the gift, discerning of spirits, because sometimes it's not obvious what's actually happening. And we see an example of this in the scripture in Acts chapter 16, Paul is ministering and there is this girl following him around and saying, these men are prophets of the most high God. Now that sounds good, right? It sounds like a good thing. That sounds like a good endorsement. The only thing is that Holy Spirit gave him the ability to discern that she was actually demon possessed. And Paul did not want his ministry being endorsed by a demon-possessed girl. You know, sometimes you don't want certain people to endorse what you're doing. So he turned around and he cast this demon out of her. That was discerning of spirits. And I want to point out, this is not called the gift of discernment. How many have ever heard someone say, I have the gift of discernment? There is nothing in the Bible called the gift of discernment. We need to be discerning. You should be discerning in your life. But many people say, I have the gift of discernment and really they have the gift of criticism. <laughs> yeah. 
And so listen, oh, I just have the gift of discernment. And I, I grew up in church, so I heard a lot of church lingo growing up. So I said that. I said that when I was a young guy. Well, I have the gift of discernment. And really, I was a snotty little fart <laughs> is what I was. So when you hear someone say, I had the gift of discernment, oftentimes what that means is I'm critical, I'm judgmental, and I want you to think that my opinion is God's opinion. Mm, that's not how it is. It's not, there's no gift of discernment. We should be discerning, but it's the gift of discernment of spirits. That is a gift. And I discern that some of you have a critical spirit. <laughs> I love you. Okay, so then there are the declarative gifts. And you could think of them as proclaiming gifts. So we have, first, we have the discerning gifts or perceiving, um, declarative gifts or proclaiming. First is prophecy. Prophecy is a message of encouragement from God through a person for the edification of people. So understand, in 1 Corinthians 14, we see that prophecy is for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of God's people. That is building people up encouraging them and comforting them. That is what prophecy is used for, never for correction. So, because this has happened before, someone has gotten up and they've tried to correct or call someone out and they've tried to say that, you know, it was a prophetic word from God. So it, it, I've seen it happen like this. A person will get up and they'll say, uh, thus saith the Lord, all the leaders of this church are totally whacked. And we're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> like, and that's not how God uses prophecy. That was not a message from God because God gives prophecy for edification, exhortation, and comfort. He does not correct through prophecy. These gifts are given to us to build us up. And prophecy, uh, Paul says, is the highest of the gifts that we should pursue love and desire, desire gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, people hear the word prophecy, they sometimes they think about uh, telling the future and it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could be foretelling of things that are to come, but primarily when we think of prophecy in the biblical sense, uh, it's proclaiming a message from God, from God through a person for the encouragement of people. In 1 Corinthians 14, 31, it says, for you can all prophesy, prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. Through prophecy, we learn and we are encouraged. So sometimes when I'm writing a sermon, I feel God lay something on my heart to say, and I'm like, why? Why do you want me to say that? You're gonna make people mad at me. I don't even know what this is about. I don't wanna say that. And God's like, you just say that, okay? And then I'll, I'll say that, that thing and I'll see people in our church family sitting here and they'll be like, what? What? And like looking at their spouse, like, can you believe this? Did you tell him? Did you tell him? Did you email him this week? And so in that moment, I don't know their situation, but I do sense that God is giving a message to someone through a person, just a, just a vessel through a person, but that message is from God through people. And primarily you can think of preaching or teaching as partly teaching and partly prophecy. It's for God's people for encouragement, edification, and comfort. And so if you've ever heard a sermon and you've thought, man, that message was from God for me, you've experienced prophecy. Here's the next declarative gift, it's tongues. Tongues is a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. Now, you should just all acknowledge with me that this topic of tongues perhaps has been more controversial in the church than any other topic. Yeah. Satan has tried to uh, sow dis, uh, confusion and fear and doubt around this topic more than any other issue. Some people have grown up hearing that tongues is demonic and other people have grown up hearing, if you don't speak in tongues, you might not even be saved. So there is so much confusion about this issue. The same thing was true in the church in Corinth when Paul wrote this letter. And so we see in the church in Corinth, there were people who had an unhealthy obsession with tongues. And then there were people who were afraid of it just like in churches today. It's almost like God knew what he was doing when he wrote this letter and included it in his Bible for us, okay? So I'm gonna talk about tongues as a gift for God's people. Uh, later in a couple of weeks, I'll talk about tongues as a private 
a part of your prayer life with God. That's another conversation. Today we're talking about tongues for the church as a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what this is, is God giving a message to people in a language that the giver doesn't understand. And it's a way that God can communicate with his people. It's pretty simple. It's not that crazy. Um, So people will ask, well, why don't we hear more messages in tongues on Sunday in the services? And some people are like, I'm really glad we don't. And other people are are thinking, "Uh, why don't we? Okay, well, let me talk about that. That's because we get our guidelines from the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 14, this says that if unbelievers or uninformed people come into your church and you're all speaking in tongues, they'll think you're crazy people. So the pastors of this church, we read that chapter and we understand the context that we are in. That on Sunday, when we have church services, there are always many people in each service who are unbelievers and uninformed and ignorant of this topic. Not stupid, but just uninformed about this topic. And so if they're in church and there are messages in tongues going off left and right, people are going to freak out. And I can tell, I mean, it's, it's not like it's a, a surprise because it's the word of God and it's perfectly true. But I, I grew up and I saw this happen sometimes, okay? I saw people in church who were not believers or they were uninformed about this topic and they saw someone give a message in tongues and they were amazed, <laughs> but not in a good way, <laughs> you know? I've never seen an unsaved person hear a message in tongues and go, whoa, that was awesome, I have many times seen an unsaved person witness a message in tongues and go, whoa, what was that? And then not come back to church. (laughs) So it's kind of like God knew that that was something we need to be considerate of. And because he gives us these gifts out of love, we want to be considerate and loving towards unsaved people. So when we have a gathering on Sunday for worship where there are all kinds of people coming together who some of them don't even know Jesus, that's not a loving time to give that message. If you were in a situation with all Christians, it could be appropriate to give a message in tongues. So you shouldn't like totally freak out if you ever heard that happen. That's an appropriate setting for that. Now, here's what Paul says in chapter 14. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Okay. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words with a tongue. Okay. So he's communicating this idea throughout chapters 12, 13, and 14, that as far as public worship services are concerned, we should make prophecy the priority because that way everyone can understand both the newcomer and the, the Christian. Okay. So he gives these guidelines, but then We need to understand that, you know, in case we get the impression that he's not uh, uh, for tongues, he does at the end of chapter 14 say, but do not forbid speaking in tongues. So we want to be wise. We want to create a safe environment for unbelievers to come to, but we should not be afraid of the gifts of the Holy Spirit or forbid someone from exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Are we on the same page? If there is a message in tongues, though, something else should happen. And that's this next gift, interpretation of tongues. This is understanding and expressing the thought or intent of the message in tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse five, here's what Paul says. I wish you could all speak in tongues. 1 Corinthians, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse five, just pause real quick. He said, I wish you could all speak in tongues. We should just pause there and acknowledge that phrase. Two sides of that coin. First side, not everyone spoke in tongues. So that tells you right right up front, there were people in the church who did not. And that's okay, right? So that means if you're in church right now and you're like, well, I've never spoken in tongues, like that's okay. Paul said right there, he showed us that not everybody did either back then. If everybody was supposed to, he would have said, yo, 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 why aren't you all speaking in tongues? You're supposed to do that. But he said, I wish you all would. So on the other side of that coin, we should acknowledge that he said, I wish you all would. Like, in other words, it's a good thing. It's a gift. It's for your benefit. Okay, so he said, I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues. And you've probably heard people say that. But look at the next word. Unless, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. 
So if someone gave a message in tongues in the right setting with other Christians and someone else can interpret that message, then it's actually on the same level as prophecy or very close to the same level as prophecy. It's beneficial to the whole church. You can understand it and it's a gift. Okay, so that's a good thing. Now we should point out a few things here. Um, This is called the interpretation, not the translation of tongues. And there's a difference. The the, The UN, when they come together from different countries, they have translators, not interpreters. Translators give a word for word translation. Interpreters give the general thought or idea behind an idea. So that's why the UN has translators because they're talking about some pretty important topics. If someone starts talking about a bomb, I mean, you wanna know exactly what they said word for word, right? But the gift of interpretation of tongues is giving the general thought or idea behind, an idea, uh, behind a message. So like if you've ever had like a Spanish interpreter, you might, um, or I might say, like you might speak Spanish, I might say like, where's the bathroom? And he might say, he wants to know where the bathroom is. You know, but like he could express it in a lot of different ways. He could give a short uh, sentence. He could give a long interpretation. And so here's why I'm pointing that out. Because sometimes people have tried to use this topic of interpretation to discredit giving a message in tongues. Because they'll say, well, there was a long message in tongues and a short interpretation or a short message in tongues and a long interpretation. So they must not be valid because they don't line up but it doesn't have to be a word for word translation. It's an interpretation of the general thought or idea. So for example, if you have a son and you ask your son, hey son, how was your uh, day at school? Your son is gonna respond, it was fine. And you'll be like, well, anything else? Like, you know, did did, did you have a test? Did your teacher like give you an assignment? Yeah, it's good. On the other hand, if you ask your daughter, <laughs> how was your day at school? She's gonna say, I woke up at 6, 10, I overslept by 10 minutes. Obviously I was running late, so I was frantic and I had a bad uh, hair day and so I couldn't get ready on time. And then Susie showed up to pick me up and she was too late and so I felt nervous. I was like, is everyone gonna think I don't care about school? And I got to school, I found out how to pop test. And I was like, oh no, what am I? And then my friend Susie, she's always smarter than me and she gets good grades. And it's like, you better have some time, right? <laughs> Two different accounts of the same day expressed, one very long, one very short, okay? So just understand that's kind of what we might see with an interpretation of tongues. Then there are the dynamic gifts, the gifts of power. These include the gift of faith, the gifts of healing, and the working of miracles. So faith is the supernatural impartation of confidence for a specific situation. This isn't the same as saving faith, that we have faith in Jesus and that we've all had that kind of faith and it saves us from sin. Um, This is supernatural impartation of confidence for a specific situation. So maybe you've ever heard stories about martyrs who were Christians and and they were executed for following Jesus and they go to the stake and they're burned alive, but they, they die singing hymns of praise to God. How do they have that kind of faith and peace in that situation? Shouldn't they be afraid or rethinking their decision to live for Jesus in that moment? But they had a supernatural impartation of confidence for that particular situation. I don't know about you, but I'm really grateful that God does this for us. There have been times when I, as the pastor, have been nervous about situations in our church and God has used other people to minister to me by giving them a supernatural impartation of faith, which encouraged me and edified me. Where I'm like, oh yeah, it will be okay. God is in control. That's right, that's right. I totally knew that, (laughs) right? Like, I'm grateful that God does this for us. Aren't you grateful that God, like if you got a bad report from the doctor about your health, God could give you a gift of faith that it's gonna be okay. And you can have confidence for a situation. Then there's the gift of healing. These are gifts of healings in the Greek, it's plural. It's supernatural endowments of divine health. And so again, I wanna point out, if you ever heard someone say, I have the gift of healing. No, you don't. The Holy Spirit has the gift of healing. And he can work through whoever he wants to bring healing to someone who needs healing. That doesn't mean that he can not work through the same person on more than one occasion, But just remember, it's not just that one person has this gift. If that was the way it was, and only one person had the gift of healing and you couldn't get to that guy, like what would you do? You'd be in a bad situation. But fortunately, you always have access to the Holy Spirit. He has the gifts of healing. So you could pray, ask him to heal you. He could work through you to heal you, or he could work through your uh, friend, Joe Schmo, to heal you. 
It doesn't have to be through a pastor. It doesn't have to be through someone special. It could be through anyone as he wills. Right, so just a story for you. One time I had a friend before a church service on Sunday morning, asked me how I was feeling. I told him I didn't feel good. I was gonna, I felt like I was gonna throw up, honestly. And it wasn't because I was nervous about preaching. I just felt sick. And he said, you know, can I pray for you? And I was like, yeah, it's a good idea. Like, right, let's do that. So he prayed for me and, and like instantly in a second, I felt totally better. And I was like, what? That was awesome. Yeah. It was just a quick moment of healing, but I, I wanted to point out it wasn't me praying for healing for someone. It was someone, a young adult in the church praying for healing for me and the Holy Spirit worked through him in that moment. So if you're available to God to be used by him, he might choose to work through you to bring healing to someone. You might hear God speak to you and say, I want to heal that person. And you're gonna have to decide in that moment, will I pray for healing for that person or am I gonna ignore God's voice because I don't wanna get into a weird situation? Right? It's normal to feel fear in that moment and say, well, you know, if I pray for him, what if he doesn't get healed? I'm going to look really dumb. <laughs> but if you feel God is speaking to you, he might choose to work through you. And if you have faith, he might work through you to bring healing to someone. We see many accounts of people being healed in scripture. There are also, I want to point out, um, it's the plurality gifts, plural, of healings in the Greek. There are different time, times for healing. There are different types of healing that God brings. And one of the things that God laid on my heart this week was that one of the areas that many of us need healing in is emotional healing. And many, many people who have experienced pain from their past because of different traumatic situations or heartbreak have emotional wounding in their heart and their soul, and they can't seem to get past it in their own strength. But the Holy Spirit brings the gift of healing to not just our physical body, but our spirit. And so you might need to experience the gift of healing, the healing power of the Holy Spirit emotionally in your soul. And he will do that for you. The next gift is the working of miracles. This is the divine intervention that changes our natural circumstances. And there might be times when in your natural circumstances, you need God's help. Have any of you ever witnessed a miracle? Show of hands, if you have. You've seen a miracle happen in your life. That's awesome. God does miracles. And the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. In other words, God does not change. Theologians say that God is immutable. It means he does not change. So he's the same. He did miracles in the Old Testament time. He did miracles in Jesus' time. And he does miracles in the time of the New Testament church, which is our time. That means if God is still God, which he is, then miracles are still gonna happen. Right, that's just how he, that's how he works. He gets up in the morning and he does miracles. He's like, I want coffee. And it's like, poof, let there be coffee, right? That's just how he does it. Like he's a miraculous God. So don't be surprised if God will do miracles in your life. And, and we all want God to do miracles. There's been times we've all prayed for him to do miracles. So we know that God does them and we're good with that. Um, and I'll just point out that if you've been saved by Jesus Christ, you've experienced the greatest miracle of all. So that's a good thing. And I always want us to be aware of that because sometimes we get kind of caught up in this idea of miracles that need to be uh, some type of supernatural display of power. But the most supernatural display of God's miraculous power is when a soul that is dead in sin is reborn in life through Jesus. You know, because... We read about miracles, like in the Old Testament, and maybe you've read you know, a miracle and you thought, man, that'd be so cool, like how God parted the Red Sea and they walked across in the dry land. I wish I could see God do that. That'd be so cool. Like if God would part my swimming pool and I could like walk through my swimming pool, like <laughs> check it out, right? But just think about this, right? The, the Hebrew people that walked across that dry land, many of them still perished from their lack of faith. And if you, you could experience God heal, healing in your body, you could, hear, you could experience a healing in your body, but if your soul is not healed and regenerated before God, you'll still perish. You need God to heal your soul. So that's why salvation is the greatest miracle of all. And we see miracles take place in this church every week when people experience Jesus, yes. amen? Yes. Now understand, as we get closer to the end of this message, the purpose of these gifts is love. And I want to point out that in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about love. 
So in chapter 12, he talks about the gifts. In chapter 13, he talks about love. In chapter 14, he gives instructions about how to use these gifts. So he says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And that's a really good just understanding for all of us. It's so funny, this passage, which people read at weddings because it's about love. Like, it's so romantic. It's about the gifts of the spirit, right? I bet they don't know that. Um, all these gifts are to bring us up, to build us up closer to God and to a fuller understanding of his love. And as we exercise these gifts, a church body should become more loving, more loving. These gifts are to bless us and bring love uh, to us. Some people, now I brought this chapter up because I wanna point out some things to you. Some people in different church backgrounds will try to say that these gifts of the spirit are not for us today. That they were for a time, but we don't need them anymore. And here's why they say that because of this next verses I'm gonna read. It says in verse eight, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge or words of knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So there have been people who read this and they say, well, when the perfect comes, the need for those gifts ceases and their interpretation has been that the perfect referenced in that verse is the word of God. And so their argument is that we now have the Bible, so we don't need those gifts. We now have the revelation of the Holy Spirit through the word of God, we don't need the gifts. And that's totally ridiculous. And it's a terrible understanding of this passage. Honestly, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad, but it's ridiculous. Think about this. Verse nine said, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, we're human beings. We have limited knowledge. We're working through sinful human fallen bodies. And so we don't know everything and we're just limited in our understanding. Okay. Verse 10 says, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Well, what is the perfect? The Bible never uses this word in Greek to refer to itself. It is perfect. The scriptures say the Bible of God, the word of God is pure, it's flawless, it's without error. So it is perfect, but it doesn't use that word to describe itself. However, there is someone else who does. In Matthew 5:48, Jesus says, be perfect as I am perfect. So Jesus is perfect. And when the perfect one, Jesus comes, we will not need these gifts anymore because as Christians will be transformed, we'll no longer understand in part or partially, we'll have a full understanding. We won't need gifts of healings after Jesus comes because we'll have restored perfect bodies. You're tracking like this makes sense? It just, it's just common sense as we apply that when Jesus comes, we won't need the gifts of the spirit like we do now. They, they won't be necessary, but on this earth, we do need the gifts of the spirit. We do. It says in verse 13 of that chapter, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these, of these is love. Again, reiterating this idea in heaven, when Jesus creates a new heaven and a new earth, perfect, uh, his kingdom is perfectly established. Um, faith, hope, and love are all good, but we won't need faith quite like we do right now because we'll see Jesus face to face. We won't need hope quite like we do right now because we'll already be living in victory. Like you don't have to hope that much when you're victorious, right? We will still fully enjoy love and we'll actually understand God's love and love him even more fully than we do now. That's why it says the greatest of these is love. But this reinforces the understanding that until Jesus comes, we need faith, we need hope, we need love, and we need the gifts of the spirit. I do wanna point out at this, at this point, in 1 Corinthians 14, as we talk about these gifts, Paul says, don't be children in your thinking and your thinking be mature. And now this is so good for us as a church to be reminded, don't be children, don't be immature in your thinking about these gifts. So don't be obsessing about one type of gift. 
Don't be afraid of another gift because you don't understand it. Don't be childish. Here's another part of that. Don't be children in your thinking. Understand we have a perfect God, amen? amen. And he chooses to work through imperfect people. Amen. Us, okay, right? Like that's us. So anytime God works through imperfect people, imperfect people sometimes mess up. Now, because we're mature thinkers as Christians, we know that. So if another Christian maybe speaks out of line or exercises one of these gifts in an incorrect way, a mature Christian goes, oh, he's just imperfect and maybe he made a mistake. I can have grace in this moment and show that brother and sister mercy, right? It's the same way, like if you have a child in your family, and the kid poops his pants, you don't throw him out of the family. And go, oh, get away! You say, he made a mess. We're gonna clean him up. We're gonna teach him and we're gonna still be family, okay? So if someone in your church exercises a gift and they're kind of out of line, you need to know like, I'm not gonna freak out and be like, oh my gosh, what is happening? I'm never coming back to this church. Christians are crazy, right? That's immature thinking. You know, mature says, I, 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 hey, that person's imperfect. My, my leaders are gonna teach that person and help him. So it's gonna be okay, right? That's mature thinking. We're all on the same page. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. And that's the theme of John 14, 15, and 16. I'm going to be with God, say goodbye to me, say hello to the Holy Spirit. In, cha in chapter 16, verse seven, he says, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come, that's the Holy Spirit. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So let's get on the same page because a lot of people get nervous about the Holy Spirit and they're afraid of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus, the senior pastor of God's church said, it's better for you that I leave so the Holy Spirit can come. It's better. Jesus chose to limit himself to a human body and he has a glorified body, but he still limits himself to being in one place at one time. So aren't you glad that we don't come to church each year and we're waiting for that one time when Jesus makes his world tour and shows up in Mesa, Arizona? Like, man, that's gonna be a great day when that finally comes. Like, I got some questions for that guy. In reality, we have the Holy Spirit with us every day, dwelling inside of us and present with us every time we gather together as a church. And so he is our friend and it's for our benefit. Some of you are kind of what you would call logical thinkers. You have that engineer brain. You wanna know how things work and why they work the way they do. And so when the gifts of the Holy Spirit or even the Holy Spirit in general comes up, some of you freak out. And you're like, I wanna understand this. I don't get it. I've got so many questions. I just don't understand. I just don't understand. I can't handle this. No, 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 no. And it's kind of like we talked about a few weeks ago where you know, it's very easy and common to say, well, I want the Holy Spirit, but I don't want that. Because I don't understand that. But listen, whether you're a logical thinker or however you feel about the Holy Spirit, if you have fears and you have concerns or misunderstandings, maybe there are parts of the Holy Spirit you just don't understand, you can't wrap your mind around. Um, I want to give you an important message this morning. Get over it. <laughs> just get over yourself and your need to understand God perfectly. God is supernatural. I'm a natural being. So God does not fit into my classifications of human understanding. And I'm so glad that he does not. Because in my naturalness, I have all kinds of problems and challenges that I cannot fix in my own power. And so I need a supernatural God. I need a God whose ways are higher than my ways, right? We need God. We need our God. We're glad that we have a God who is supernatural, who can work outside of our comfort zone or outside of our understanding. And I, I know for you that when we get into these situations in life that are challenging and difficult and overwhelming, we need God's super to invade our natural and to fix us and to help us and to give us strength to go on where we could not go on in our own natural ability, to give us the ability to minister and bring the gospel to others in a way we could not do on our own. So I wanna ask you, are you available to God? These gifts, these charismatic gifts, these grace gifts, 
These grace gifts are available to every person who receives them according to the will of the Holy Spirit. The power of God is available to you, but only to the extent you make yourself available to God. Just the same way that Jesus is available to everyone, but only if we make ourselves available to him will we experience his love. So I wanna ask you, do you need to make yourself available to God? Let me just point this out. We do not seek after the gifts. We don't pursue gifts, we pursue Jesus. And we pursue the will of the Holy Spirit. And as we pursue Jesus, the Holy Spirit makes us more like him and he exercises these gifts in our life. And let me say this to the person that's like, well, I don't wanna be weird. I would say, it's too late. <laughs> you're, all, you're probably already kind of weird. And the Holy Spirit's not gonna make you worse. If anything, he's gonna help you. <laughs> he's gonna help you be more like Jesus and you'll be even a lot more fun to be around, I promise. The Holy Spirit doesn't wanna make you weird. He does wanna make you more like Jesus. And he does want you to make yourself available to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your spirit. We ask that you would give us understanding and help us to be open to the working of your Holy Spirit's power through us in our lives. Lord, we know that we cannot do what you've called us to do on our own. We need a power that is outside of us, that is greater than us. And Lord, even though we don't always understand the way you work, we know that you're a good father. You give good gifts to your children whom you love, Lord. So we thank you that you have not abandoned us as orphans or called us to build your kingdom in our own power, but you've given us a helper who will guide us through this process and lead us into all truth. His name is the Holy Spirit and he's our friend, amen.